Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Please be seated. Thanks. Wow, what a great, what a great time, and uh, thank you for being here, and thank you, pastors, for inviting me and letting me be a part of all this. I love the Dream Center. I loved it from, uh, from the time it was uh, a seed in, uh, in Tommy's heart. It wasn't even called the Dream Center. It was actually going to be called the L.A. International Church. Most of you never knew that, did you? It shows you how far back I go. Amen. And uh, so I'm just uh, so honored and so blessed to be here tonight and always a great joy. And thank you for being here and thank you for uh, giving. Uh, you know, uh, inside of every church, our church, the church worldwide, inside of every church, maybe you're visiting here tonight, like people from Greenville, South Carolina. I've been there many times. Love Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, so, uh, but inside of every church, uh, you know, there's three families. Think with me now. There's three families inside of every church. Number one, there's the church family. That's everybody that calls the Dream Center, Abundant Living, Dream City, wherever. It's everyone that calls that church their church, right? The church family. The whole church family, everybody. And then inside of that, there's another family. It's the serving family. These are the people that volunteer, that are working all over the campus. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Right? Hard to have church without the serving family. Amen? Yeah, amen. I said amen. amen. How, many, how many of you are grateful there are people serving in nursery tonight, right? Yeah, I am, yeah, uh-huh. I am too. All right, but I mean, that, you know, serving family, great. And then there's another family. And that's the giving family. Now, think with me for a moment, please. Right? Can, can we think for a minute? Think with me for a moment. The reality is, without the giving family, the other two families don't exist. They're not here. They, they don't exist. Amen. Okay, now if we were back in El Paso right here, I'd say welcome to Big Boy Church, right? And this is Big Boy Church we're talking about right now. Uh, that's the reality, right? Without our giving, without our tithes, without our offerings, there is no church for the church family to gather at. There is no church for the serving family to serve at. Now, when we understand that, how many of you understand what I'm saying to you tonight, right? So when we understand that, then we understand why Satan fights us over giving. Right? I mean, he'll fight you over coming to church. But once you get there, well, you're there. He'll fight you over serving. Right? But he never stops fighting you over giving. I've been tithing for over 50 years. And not every month, but about every other month. I have to fight in my mind whether I'm going to do it or not. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Because he knows that if I quit and you quit and he can get 100 more people to quit, well, then what we're able to do is going to drop and we're not going to advance the kingdom of God. Amen? Can we go a little further? This has nothing to do with what I'm going to teach on tonight, but it's still good, right? The, the other reality is this. Can, 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 can I just address something else? Yeah. This is the only part of society, church, is the only part of society where people come and they expect parking, lights, chairs, <laughs> carpet, security, wow. nursery, lighting, good sound, and we want it all for free. <laughs> and if you talk to me, if you talk to me about giving, I'm going to get mad and never come back. Because all it's about is the money. No. It's not all about it, but it's definitely a part of it. Come on, grow up. Amen. Amen. You don't, you don't act that way. You don't act that way when you go to the movie. 
You don't walk up and say, hey, I want to see Avengers. That would be 15 bucks. What? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Marvel's got millions. Why do I have to pay? No, you just pay it out and go in, right? You go to McDonald's, right? You don't walk up and say, I want a Big Mac and fries. That will be $9.55. What? Just when you come here. Can I tell you why? Because the devil doesn't care about where you give the other, but he cares about you giving here. Amen? All right. So I pray, I pray tonight that if you're not a part of the giving family here or wherever you go to church, that you'll become a part of it. And don't tell me you're going to pray about it. It's not a matter of praying. What I think that's one of the funniest things I've heard, right? Well, Pastor, I'm going to pray about giving. What? Are you going to try to talk the Lord into changing the Scripture? Because <laughs> I don't think you have to pray about doing what the Word tells you to do. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Hallelujah. <laughs> all right. Well, let's get into what we're going to look at tonight. Is that all right? Amen. Father, thank you now. Speak to us by your word and by your spirit. Lord, we've come here tonight to worship you. We've come here tonight to glorify you. We've come here tonight to be encouraged by seeing other believers and to encourage other believers by them seeing us. We've come here tonight to enjoy one another's company. And Lord, we've come here tonight to learn. Speak to us by your word and by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. A few weeks ago, I was uh, uh, engaged in a conversation with my wife, Lynn, and we were talking about life in our world in 2019. We discussed how different the world is today than even a few years ago. And we, she lives in South Africa, and I live in Texas, and... and uh, so, you know, we have a different perspective on things. She lives in another country on another continent. And, you know, I live in the greatest place to live. <laughs> it's just hard to be humble when you're from Texas. So, uh, but as we discussed it, we were discussing, listen to me now, please. I'm going to make a couple of statements in the next few moments that are, that to me, I, I, I don't want you to interpret them that I'm being political because I'm not. Can, can, we, can, we just, can, can we just look at something and everybody get your chips off your shoulders <laughs> and just let me talk to you for a minute? Yeah. Because I, I need to say this to take you where I feel like God wants you to go. Is that all right? Yeah. Amen. All right, so we are surrounded uh, in our society with so much chaos. Chaos in governments worldwide. Worldwide. Chaos in governments, media, families. Oh my God, isn't, I mean, it's astounding, isn't it? The chaos that's going on in families today. You know, I mean, every Friday and Saturday night, I'm at home uh, and I'm watching live PD. <laughs> and I, I'm like a part of live PD nation, man. I mean, I'm into it, right? And uh, I know the dogs' names. I know all the canine. I know all of them, right? So, uh, and they used to film it in El Paso. So I was like, oh, I know those guys. <laughs> they were in church last week, amen. So, amen. And, uh, you know, and I, I'm just astounded at the chaos that goes on in families. How many of you would agree with me? It goes on in families. And then on top of that, the anger that we see exhibited in our world today, the frustration, the violence, oh my God. And those of you that are relatively young, I, I just want to tell you today, it hasn't always been like this. And I know, I know old guys always talk about how great it used to be, but I'm telling you the truth. In some ways... It was better years ago. 
Now, you have no point of perspective on that, but the anger, the frustration, the violence, the amount of offense, yelling, the amount of abuse that goes on in our world today, addictions, a sense of hopelessness in so many people's lives, the, the unbelievable amount of disrespect that we see going on around us, the fear, the uncertainty, the immorality. I could just keep going on and on. And by now you're like, I wish I hadn't come to church. You're not helping me. Uh, you know, politically we have parties that seem now that, that, that their main goal in life is to fix blame and not fix problems. And their main goal in life is to throw each other under the bus every day. And, and, and our problems inside of our cities and our country and our nation are not being addressed. And, wow, so, you know, one thing, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know, based on what I'm watching, that there's going to be more disrespect, more mocking, more slander, more accusation. And that's the world. And then the question comes, how do we, how do we as children of God respond? How do we respond? If we're not careful, we'll get sucked up into it. And people will look at us and see us no different than anybody else. And yet, the Bible says that we are salt and light. Verses that we all know and we quote, but do we live it? Are we embracing that reality that I am a child of God? We sing it, we say it, we write it, we put it on our cars. But what does it mean? How do we? So Lynn and I, we're talking. How should we respond? Can I give you some thoughts on this? Yes, Amen. If you have your Bible, if you would turn, or I think, I think they may put it up on the screen. Uh, Matthew 13. Right? Uh, Jesus does a parable. Okay? In the first part. Beginning in verse uh, uh, 24, he gives a parable. And then, this is one of the few times in Scripture that he comes back later and explains the parable. Whew, I wish he'd done that to all of them, right? <laughs> wow. Whoo, Lord. Okay. But he did it to this one and a couple others. And so he addresses, and, and he, he, this is the parable of the sower sowing the good seed and the enemy coming in and sowing the tares. You know that story, right? So, so the tares grow up with the good. So the bad grows with the good. And that is the reality of life, isn't it? Right? That, that we are in the world as children of God. And for whatever reason, God has chosen to leave us here. He's, he's left us here, right? We're here. Now, I know some of you are praying every night that he'll come back. But so far, your prayers have gone unanswered, right? You're, you're here. And, and so then we have to ask ourselves, well, am I here for a purpose? I believe we're here. Hey, Rich. Hey, buddy. I believe we're here for more than to pay taxes and then die. I'm, I'm not embracing that as, as my reality or your reality. Right? So let's go through it really quick. Or let's, I wish I could read all of it to you, but for the sake of time, let's just go to the explanation. Verse 37, Jesus answered and said to them, He that sows the good seed is the Son of Man. Now, the Son of Man is Jesus, right? So then the question then comes up. He's talking about real life. He's talking about the good growing up with the bad. 
He's talking about lifetime of good growing with the bad, the good seed growing with the bad seed, right? So we're in this world together, and we're here, all right? And he, and he, and he says that Jesus sows good seed. So then the question I've got to ask myself as I'm living in this world, so Jesus is sowing good seed. Am I receiving it? Am I receiving on purpose the good seed Jesus is sowing in the earth? Am I receiving it? Are my heart, my ears, my eyes, my hearing, am I hearing and understanding? Am I inclined? Am I focused on the good seed? Am I seeing the good seed? Right, the good seed of God's word. Now he also goes on and says the good seed are the children of the kingdom. So am I seeing not only the good seed of God's word, Mark the fourth chapter, am I also seeing the good seed of God's, king, God's children around me? That I'm not here by myself? Hmm? And can I just tell you something tonight? Quit. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying this to you because I care about you. Quit believing the plan and the lie that media is telling us that the church is dying in America. Can I tell you the truth tonight? Every pastor I know in America is adding more services, doing more stuff, making more things happen. Yes, there are some churches that maybe uh, aren't surviving. Okay, but they're in the minority, my family. We just bought our third building in El Paso. We do uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine services a week. Right? And we're not unique in that. They, they have more, Phoenix, I mean, uh, how many bills y'all got now, 100? I mean, every time I turn around, you know, Luke and Tommy are buying a new building or more. Somebody's giving them one. I'm like, God, I know you don't love them more than me, but how come they keep getting buildings given and I have to buy mine? I don't get an answer. Amen. So, there's good seed. Now, if we don't, hear me now, if we don't focus on the good seed that is going on in the earth, the good seed that is growing up, we don't focus on inclining our ears and our eyes and our hearts to the good seed of God's word, then we're going to focus on the tares. And Satan is also sowing. Did you see that? Jesus is sowing into the earth. And Satan is sowing into the earth, right? And he goes on and he says it here. The field is the world, the good seed of the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked ones. So Satan is sowing also into the world that we live in. God's not the only one working down here, right? Satan is also sowing. He understands the laws of sowing and reaping. And he is also sowing, right? Right? So he is sowing these tares. Now, the Bible says that tares are seed. The Bible dictionary says that tares are seed that look good, but they don't bear worthwhile fruit. Hmm? So then I have to ask myself, what seeds am I letting be sown in me? Huh? You know, a seed may look good, but that doesn't mean it's going to bear worthwhile fruit. Right? So I need, to be, I need to be checking the source of the seed. I need to see what fruit that seed has borne in other places where it was received. Hmm? Does that make sense? So 
you know, I want to bring forth, God wants you to bring forth, your family, my family, your church, my church, He wants us to bring forth worthwhile fruit. Worthwhile fruit. Now watch this, jump with me down to verse 40, right? He said, and therefore the tares are gathered and burned into fire, and so shall it be at the end of this world. Now, this is interesting because the tares grow up with the good seed. And if the tares are not handled properly, then what happens is in the first part of the parable, the master, Jesus, reveals that if the tares and the wheat aren't handled properly, the tares will destroy the harvest of the wheat at the end. Now, if you don't get anything, please get this. That's one of Satan's goal for your life, my life, your church, my church, your family, my family, and that is to mess up our ending. Right? To mess up our endings. All right? It's amazing how much the Bible has to say about endings. And why are endings so important? Get ready, because endings produce our beginning. Oh, let me let me prove it to you. Let, let me let me show it to you, right? Go with me to Genesis. Right? Let me show you Genesis chapter 1. Are you glad you came tonight? Yeah. Right? Now watch this. You could, uh, this we'll just take one second. Right? Uh, verse 5. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, when we talk about a day, how do we can describe a day? We describe a day as the morning and the evening. Right? Right now, we're moving towards the end of the day. Right? The start of the day is the morning. So we think of a day as morning and ending. Right? God sees life this way. Ending, beginning. His ways are not our ways. He doesn't think like we think. Okay? So with every ending, God always has a new beginning for you. And what Satan, did you catch that? Right? Did you catch what I just said to you? With every ending in your life, God has a new beginning. That's why Jesus is called Alpha and Omega. He said, I am Alpha and Omega. I am beginning and ending simultaneously. I am both things at the same time. I am both things at the same time. Whenever God starts something, he already knows where it's going to end. And when he has something ready to end, there's already a new alpha waiting, standing there, a new beginning, standing there, waiting. So when that ends, a new beginning starts. So what Satan tries to do, is this making sense to you? What Satan tries to do in my life, in your life, is he tries to get in our endings. Because if he can get in my ending, then he can mess up my beginning that God has for me, my new beginning. Huh? All right. So Satan wants to affect our endings because in doing that, he can, he can affect our beginnings. And he tries to do the same thing to all of us all the time. Now, go with me back to Matthew. Matthew 13, okay? About another hour and 15 minutes we'll be done. Amen. So it's good. We're good. I don't have to go anywhere until 11 tomorrow morning, so I'm, I'm good to go. Amen. All right? No, I'm just kidding. Kind of. Verse 41, watch this. And the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. So this is something that all of us need to be on guard of because the tares can produce this in our lives. The world that we are living in can cause us, even though we are children of the God and we are living in the kingdom, this offense and iniquity 
is growing up right next to us. Isn't that amazing? It's growing up right next to me and you. And if I'm not careful, that stuff will get in me. It'll get in you. It'll get in us. And we have to be careful. Can I hear a good amen on that? Right? We've got to be careful because he said this offense and this iniquity needs to be removed from the kingdom of God. So I've got to be on guard and be careful, right? Because I don't want this to get in me and I don't want it to get in my family and I don't want it to get in my church. But he said that it's there. It's there. So I've got to be on guard for it, right? Let me give you the definition of the word offend. It means you become displeased. It's a very interesting word in the Greek language. It's actually like a progressive definition. So you become displeased, right? Something displeases you, right? And then... If you don't deal with that displeasure, you don't get it into perspective, you don't forgive or you don't ask for forgiveness or you don't hear what God's word is saying, you don't incline your ear to the good seed. Can I get a good amen, right? You don't plant good seed in your life, but that tear gets inside of you and you don't deal with it. Then the dictionary, the Bible dictionary says you become displeased, then you become resentful. This is life. This is why this book is so spectacular, right? You, you, become, re, you, you, you become resentful. Then if you, if you don't deal with it at that level, then you come to like a fork in the road, okay? And then resentment then peels off in one of two ways. Are you writing this down? You're going to remember this, right? It peels off into one of two ways. Number one, it says that you'll go back into sin, You go back. Hmm? Well, I never heard of that. Yeah, you have. The pig goes back to its mud. The dog goes back to its vomit. So I'm going to ask you a simple question tonight. Are you a child of God or are you a pig or are you a dog? Which one are you going to be? I'm not a pig. I'm not a dog. I like dogs, but I ain't a dog. I'm a child of God. Maybe at one time I was a pig and I was a dog, but I'm not one now. I'm a child of God. I'm not going back to the mud. I'm not going back to the, to the vomit. Amen? Not going to do it. But you can. You can if you don't watch your heart, if you don't plant good seed in your heart, if you don't watch out for these tares that are trying to get into you. The chaos, the evil, the anger, the immorality, the stuff it's trying to get into you. It's trying. Hmm. But if you, if you don't go back into sin, you know what then happens? You, you become displeased, you become resentful. And if you don't go back into sin, the other fork in the road is you become bitter. You become bitter. I mean a lot of bitter Christians. They're not sinning. I mean, by that, they didn't go back into sin. Who are they bitter? Huh? The dictionary defines bitterness, listen to this, as intense hostility. You know anybody that's bitter? Hmm? If you're sitting next to them, just keep looking straight ahead. <laughs> Let me deal with them. <laughs> so so many people today can you agree with me today indulge themselves in living offended lives they don't wait for something to happen they leave the house offended Oh, you're going to be on the freeway with them tonight. They're, ar they're already offended. <laughs> they're, ar they're already offended. Hmm? Now, we kind of laugh at that, but it's not funny when it's your mom or your grandmother or your husband or your wife or your coworker, right? 
and they're in t- and I'm going to tell you something tonight. If you pride yourself, if you're living, if you justify being offended, can I tell you something? You're going to grow old and die by yourself. Wow. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I've seen it. I've been pastoring for a long time. I guarantee you, Pastor Tommy's seen it too. Because eventually, everyone close to you is going to go, enough. I'm tired of this hostility. Don't let it happen. Plus, it's going to rob you of all of the joy and all the goodness. You're not going to get the fruit of the good seed because you're getting the fruit of the tares in your life. Jesus warned us. Amen? Amen. Iniquity is lawlessness. Huh? Don't tell me what to do. Well, somebody needs to tell you what to do. Freedom doesn't mean you get to do whatever you want, Bubba or Bubette. It doesn't mean that. It, it doesn't mean that. I don't know where we came up with that definition. Freedom means you have the right to choose to do what is right. Hmm? So life, listen, I've got to wrap it up. Life is full of endings. Get this now. Life is full of endings. Years in. Huh? But you know what? Eras in. Relationships in. You know, I I I, I always and, and I and I'm not mocking, I'm not making fun. I just think it's kind of funny and cute. But you know, we have a Christian school at our church, and so every year I have to go to the graduation, and every year at the graduation, the kids get up and they give speeches, and every year they say, we're going to be best friends forever. And I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. After this summer, you won't even see each other again, more than likely. How many of you know what I'm talking about tonight? Oh. And you mean it. Okay, so relationships end, right? So that one's kind of funny, but how many of you know not all relationships ending are funny? They're not. And let me tell you something about endings, just to remind you, sometimes they're expected. Sometimes they're abrupt. You you didn't expect it. Hmm? Bankruptcies, divorces, jobs end. Hmm? We've got people in my church, I mean, literally, they go to work Friday, got a job by lunch, they don't. Wow. Didn't see that coming. Hmm? Partnerships in. Businesses are no longer viable. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? When you think about companies that 20 years ago were Fortune 500, now they don't even exist. They're gone. Thousands of jobs gone with them. Wow. It's it's endings, right? And can I say this to you tonight? Maybe it'll help somebody. Sometimes... It just needs, it's just time to put an end to something. It it just is. So here's the deal. Satan will try to get you to not sow the right seed for your new beginning. He'll try to get you to sow the seed of regret the sow to fear, the seed of fear, the seed of anger, the seed of bitterness, the seed of resentment, the seed of hopelessness, the seed of grief. Instead of sowing the right seed that's going to give you your new beginning. Listen, just because it ended doesn't mean you ended. All right, in closing, got 10 minutes. How do we we respond to all this? 
You're going to give us some good news, Pastor? Yeah, I am. I promise. How do we respond to all this? Okay, I'm going to go through it real quick. Are you ready? Yeah. I've got like six or seven things I want to give you to help you. How do we respond to this? Well, this is a list that I came up with that, that's helped me immensely. Number one, always remember that Galatians 3.29 says that if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The word heirs means you have in your hands the promise. What promise? The promise that God made to Abraham. And what was the promise that God made to Abraham? Genesis 12, 1 through 3. As for me, God said, I will bless you. I will bless you. I will bless you. You have that promise in your hands I will bless you. Write this down. In the Hebrew text with the Old Testament written in, the word bless has two definitions. Number one, it means I will cause your life to go forward. Yes. Yes. That's it. I will cause your life to go forward. Get an image of that, right? God taking you forward. Number two, I love this one. It says I will cause your life to flow like a river. Well, I love that imagery. Hmm? I will cause your life to flow like a river, right? So when, when Satan is trying to stop you, when Satan is trying to end you, when Satan is trying to bring you to a stop, refuse to be stopped. Yeah. Amen? I am blessed. Yeah. I'm going forward. Right. Right. Hmm? I'm going forward. And I'm telling you, I've had some pretty abrupt endings in my life, things I wasn't ready for, wasn't prepared for. Bam! What would you do, Pastor? I just believed I was going forward. I could have stayed. No one would have blamed me, but I wouldn't be up here tonight talking to you. Huh? They'd all be in the back saying, boy, you remember when Charles, he was, he was such a great guy, but, you know, he had that bad ending. Oh, bless his heart. We all feel sorry for him. Maybe we ought to call him and tell him we feel bad for him, and I'm sitting at the house. Could have. Nobody would have judged me. Could have. So could you. But that's not God wills for your life. But Pastor, I had an ending. Yeah, with every ending, there's a new beginning. But you got to sow the right seed so you can get the right beginning. Amen? So you're going forward, right? How about this one? Number two, always remember John 17, verse 14 and 16. You are in the world, but you are not of the world. I am in the world, but I'm not of the world. Say it with me. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. Amen. I'm in it, but I'm not of it. I'm in it. I'm in it. I'm in it, but I'm not of it. It is not the final authority over my life. It is not the final authority. It wants to be. It will try to be. It will tell you that it is greater than the kingdom of God, but it's not. Amen? So are we children of God or are we not? Amen. Is God for us? Or is it just something we sing? No. Number three, believe the best for your future. Jeremiah 29, 11, God said, I know, I know what I have in plan for you to give you a hope and a future. To give you a hope and a future. Hmm? A hope and a future. Jeremiah 29, verse 4 and 7. Talk to your future. You know, we all know 29, 11, right? We all know that verse, right? I didn't even have to have you look at it. But we don't even know the context that it was set in. God said that to the nation of Israel when they were in captivity in Babylon. They were in captivity, and he starts off telling them, hey, got a good word for you. You're going to be here 70 years. That's the good news? 
And God said, so this is how I want you to live. He said, even though you're in captivity, he said, I want you to build houses and you'll live in them. I want you to plant gardens. You're going to eat the fruit. I want you to get married and have kids and your kids will have kids. And I want you to be fruitful and I want you to speak peace because I have a hope in the future for you. So even in a world of cap, even in a time of lack, even in a time of oppression, God said, you know what? I still have a hope in the future for you. You'll still build houses. Amen. Amen. We're in it, but we're not of it. You got to talk to your future, right? Look at look at number uh, five. Look at Ecclesiastes seven. Are they going to put it up? I guess they will. I gave it to them. I think it's up there already. All right. Look at it. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Only God can make that statement. Come on, tell me the truth tonight. If I land a thousand people up and said, hey, which is better, the beginning or the ending? Everybody, oh, the beginning. Be- the be- be- beginning. God said, no, no, better is the end of the thing than the beginning. Right. Why? Because he's going to give you a new beginning. We, gotta, we can't be afraid, right? Take responsibility for your endings. I'm not talking about laying down and quitting. I want you to reject the Pharisees' leaven. You ever hear Jesus say that? Where he, Be careful of the, the, the leaven of the Pharisees. You know what the leaven of the Pharisees was? Are you ready? I can prove it. You know what it was? Whatever will be, will be. Oh, good word. Just take life. Everything's God. No, it's not. <laughs> Jesus is pretty clear about that in Matthew 13. John 10, 10. Not everything's God. Amen. Hate that doctrine. Number whatever. Six. Okay, well, how do you respond? How do we respond to all this? Number six, Proverbs 4.23, guard your garden. Guard your garden. Guard your heart. Guard it. Guard it. Put a gate up. Just because somebody's talking doesn't mean you have to let their words get in your garden. Just because somebody's screaming doesn't mean you have to let their words get in your garden. Just because somebody's all bitter and bent out of shape, right, and telling you life is horrible and people are horrible and the world is horrible doesn't mean you have to let it get in your garden. Amen. Amen. Number seven. This sounds odd, but it'll make sense to you. Don't drink polluted water. Right? You can drink water of life. Don't run over here and drink this polluted water. Don't drink this water that got dirt in it and garbage in it that the world's trying to peddle off on you. Don't drink that polluted water. It's going to make you sick. Hmm? Yeah, but everybody's drinking it. Yeah, and they're all sick. <laughs> Look at their lives. I don't say that judgmentally. I say that sympathetically. But my family, you can drink living water. You have a right to drink unpolluted water. Make sure you're drinking good water. Amen. Last one. Don't allow your faith, hear me now, don't allow your faith to come down to the level of your experience or those around you. Listen, everyone, what is faith? Believing and speaking. I've taught you that before, I think. Everyone is believing and speaking something. Everyone is. CNN is believing and speaking something. Fox News is believing and speaking something. Democrats believe and speaking something. Republicans believe and speaking something. Right? Your neighbors believe and speaking something. The people you go to work for tomorrow, they're believing and speaking something. But you got to be careful that your faith doesn't come down to their level or to the level of your experience. Hmm? 2 Corinthians 4.13 says we've been given the spirit of faith. 
spirit of faith. So what faith are we of? Amen? Amen. In Matthew 7, Jesus compares our lives to building our house on a rock or building our house on sand, right? Both the lives encountered storms. Remember the story, right? The house built on sand falls. The word fall means it went from a higher level to a lower level. It also means they became miserable. <laughs> you know something about miserable people? They love company. <laughs> they don't want to be miserable by themselves. Love them, pray for them, give them good seed, but don't go down there. Hmm? And the problem there was the winds that blew. The winds that blew. My family... In this life, you and I have got to be willing to stand against the wind and run against the wind. That's right. Got to stand against it and run against it. Amen? Because there's winds blowing, trying to blow us off course. Stand your feet with me, please. I hope that helps you. Can I pray for you tonight? Would that be all right? Would you lift your hands towards heaven with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, we decide tonight that we are not going to let the enemy sow tares into our fields. We are not going to let him do it. We're not going to let him sow tares into our hearts. We're not going to let him do it. We're surrounded with it. And we don't see ourselves as superior or better or anything like that, Lord. But we are your children and we are by your design good ground. 2 Peter 1, 4 says you have made us partakers of your divine nature. We are by nature, good ground. And I know, looking across this room tonight, there are many people in here, Lord, that have had terrible endings and things in their lives, and many of them have ended hard lives, and they're here now, and they're beginning a new life. And I pray for them tonight. I pray for them wherever we are, here, balcony, wherever we are, that, Lord, we'll, we'll go to the good seed and allow you to sow the good seed into the good ground so we can get the new beginning that you want us to have. We're going to guard our hearts. We're not going to just lay down and quit. We're not going to throw up our hands in frustration. We're not going to lay in bed at night and pray that you come back tonight. We're children of God. If God be for us, who can be against us? I'm in the world, but I'm not of it. Somehow, some way, you are going to make a way for us. It's not just a cliche. It's a way of life. We honor you and we thank you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you all.